As you probably know, I made a second trip to Japan this summer and uh, took a little time to study the present situation among the Japanese people relating to marriage and family life. I think some of the conclusions were interesting, and while we cannot say they would be entirely applicable here, I think they do make one point clear, namely, there can be more than one way of looking at a problem. We have always taken it for granted that our own solutions were the only ones, that we must struggle on to demonstrate the infallibility of whatever attitudes we hold. In marriage among the Japanese people for the last 1800 years has been built upon an entirely different foundation from ours. The basic definition is that the purpose of marriage is that individuals shall slowly come together. That instead of a tremendous emotional impact, Relationships should ripen slowly and gradually, so that through a lifetime, two persons who begin as strangers end as almost one person. This is the Japanese psychology of marriage. To attempt to bring about this end, uh, they follow a procedure that was also prevalent in Europe until comparatively recently. Young people generally did not select marriage partners. This selection was a privilege of parents, grandparents, advisors, or priests. The idea being that it is impossible for young people to start out with the full experience of mature life. They cannot know as much at 20 as they're going to know at 40 or 50. Yet in a time of great emotional tension and almost no experience, they make decisions which are to last for their lives or if they break up are certain to leave devastating scars. The uh, families, therefore, get together and pool their common knowledge of their children. Each family knows a good deal about its own children. It knows their tastes, their uh, peculiar personalities, their attitudes, their ambitions. The parents are able to estimate very clearly the social proprieties of union, whether it is probable that these two persons will have sufficient common ground of appreciation or insight to make a success of a life together. Now, we must not assume, however, that the Japanese family forced its decision upon its children. This is not true. The parents did not require their children to marry the persons selected. They recommended, but did not require. After it seemed that a suitable marriage partner had been found, the two young people were introduced to each other, and then at a period of six months or a year of social contact, uh, they went out to the theater together, they dined. They enjoyed the scenery of the various seasons. They attended the festivals. They had considerable common knowledge of each other. And at the end of a prescribed time, either or both could express their feelings openly. And if they decided that it was not a suitable union, they were not forced to carry it on. Usually, however, in about 90% of cases, the union was accepted. First, because these young people had no other experience in life except that which was being formed for them. Furthermore, they had deep regard for their parents. They believed in the wisdom of the elders. 
They knew the danger of their own immature emotional pressures, and they felt that the parent was right in assuming that a deep compatibility of character and ability, these were more important than a powerful emotional association. The Japanese said very frankly, emotion lasts for a few hours or a few weeks or a few months, but a marriage should last for a lifetime. Therefore, it must be built upon the solid rock of common value. These young people must have spirit in common, soul interests in common. So assuming that the marriage was consummated, these young persons came together and created a home without any of the grand passion that dominates Western thinking. They respected each other. And the Japanese assumed that mutual respect is the beginning of an enduring relationship. In the early years of marriage, it was the responsibility of both young persons to preserve this respect to make sure that their conduct at all times appeared to be right and proper to the other person, that they maintained the integrities of their private and personal lives in a deep way so that the other person would always approach them with courtesy and respect. Then came the children. And in the Japanese family, the children of the first great emotional outlet. The love for the children is no longer a passion concealed. It is no longer behind the no mask of proprieties. Parents in Japan adore their children. Businessmen rush home, take off their western clothes, get into their kimono, and trot the children around the house on their backs. They love children. And the child's place in Japan is the most fortunate, perhaps, of any place in the world. These children, however, also brought up within a strong bond of respect. One of the proprieties of the Japanese home is that never will the children see the parents disrespectful to each other. Never for one moment will parents take sides or force their children to. Never will parents say unpleasant things to each other in the presence of a child. Always the proprieties remain. And as the old Japanese matchmaker points out, where there are not these flaming passions of youth and adolescence, there are not so likely to be the flaring tempers, the hates, the quick grievances, and the sudden bitter words. Relationships are on an entirely different basis. Then gradually the children grow up. And after the children have passed through their early childhoods, then in the Japanese family, you begin to see father and mother growing together. You see them becoming more and more dependent on each other. Their facial expressions become similar. They become almost inseparable. They become almost psychically aware of each other always with the same quiet faces, but always with a mysterious strength of simple, direct devotion, a simple admiration that has never been destroyed by disillusionment, a warmth that has become warmer but never blazed into some terrible conflagration. So in the end of life, these two people really become almost one soul in two bodies. And when one passes on, the other nearly always follows in a short time. And when the posthumous Buddhist name of the dead is inscribed on the little stone in the temple cemetery, the name of the survivor is placed also on the same stone where it will not belong. So that this is their way of solving problems. Now it is obvious that this way is under terrific bombardment at the present time. 
It is something that probably cannot survive into the future there any more than it could here. But there are still some points about it that are very well worth considering. There are facts and values in this relationship which has caused these people to say from the beginning, way back in the dawn of their history, that human relationships were important. They were never things to play with. They were never things to be taken lightly. The human heart is a most strange and subtle thing. It must be brought into a safe maturity. It must be taught always, not only its own value, but the importance of other hearts, and that no one shall break another heart. It's just not thinkable. So many of the Japanese and other Asiatic peoples have died of broken hearts themselves under certain conditions. But even then, they have seldom allowed others to see their pain. It is just not done. Everything is the courtesy of maintaining some form of value. I talked to a young woman who has graduated from the University of Kyoto and who is probably going to break away from the family tradition. To do it, she has to leave Japan. She's going to another country to continue her education. Because if she wishes to stay in Japan, she must face this traditional pattern. So I asked her what it all meant to her. Was she leaving because she wanted to pick her own husband somewhere? She said, no, that wasn't the real reason. The real reason was that at the time she just did not want to marry at all. She wanted to go on with her education. She wished to gain further knowledge and to become a teacher in one of the universities. A marriage would make this difficult, particularly if it was consummated in Japan. She was going to go away, but with her parents' blessing. They were not trying to prevent it. They sensed the new generation that was growing up. But they had taught her certain things. They said to her very simply, wherever you go, whoever you choose to marry, whenever you choose, Think first of respect. Can you honestly say that this person is admirable? That this person is intellectually, morally, culturally your equal? Is this person one who has fine ideals, a good background to achieve in his own field? Will he be faithful? Will he be a good father? For a woman who marries a man without solving in her own heart whether that man will be a good father is making a serious mistake. These things must be thought through. And they must be thought through before tragedies come. For a lot of emotion and very little thought will add together to form disaster. So we leave that far side of the world for a moment and see what is happening on this rather disaster-ridden continent we live in. The situation in family life is not good. Family clinics working with these problems bring in some pretty sad stories. The American home is in poor condition. Now there are many factors contributing to this poverty of values. One of the factors is the increasing self-centeredness of people. In the Western world, we are breeding a generation of individuals primarily concerned only with themselves. They are not deeply problemed by the needs of their neighbors. They are not tremendously willing to sacrifice any of their own interests for the survival of a common good. And wherever you have selfishness, you have potential disaster in human relationships. 
Another factor that has arisen in American life, perhaps a little earlier than this generation, but has fed into our time a number of disruptive forces, is the calculated marriage. A marriage of some type of advantage. Now, in the canons of marriage in China and Japan, there is no reference whatsoever as to the desirability of marrying a rich husband. This is not considered as any part. And in selecting marriage mates, a wealthy family will probably not select an impoverished person, but will select one of their own status. And a family of moderate means will under no conditions marry into a wealthy family. They cannot overlook uh, what Socrates said, that to marry wealth is to get a master, not a husband. These points are taken into consideration, but young people do not, for the, mo for the most part, think of these things. And in our last generation, we had too many scheming parents striving desperately to make what they considered to be brilliant marriages for their children. In these brilliant marriages, no thought was given to values. No thought was given to character or ability or temperament. Most everything was centered upon advantage. I know a number of cases that have come to me of miserable persons who have the consequences of such parental advice. Their lives have been completely ruined, and for every dollar they got through a fortunate married, marriage, they had hours of pain and sorrow, and finally, of bad conscience. I've seen that work very definitely. In the American pattern as we have it today, we are not producing any clear insight into the marriage problem any more than we are producing it in nearly any other area of modern life. How many young people today are taught the real basic importance of marriage for mutual assistance? Marriage for true enduring companionship. Marriage for improvement through cooperation. Marriage in order to provide a good, happy, normal, healthy, unselfish environment for the raising of children. These things are not taught, except in a very few areas. There are a few schools in which these principles are clearly stated. And the divorce rate among the graduates of these schools is much lower than the average. We are having a great many very early marriages these days. And uh, marriages of teenagers that break up, and many do. Statistics would indicate that the greatest cause of the breakup is parental interference, not the misunderstandings or troubles of the young people. Someone has to get into the situation and cause a difficulty and trouble when there's always someone ready to do so. We have the lack of responsibility, the lack of integrities, the lack of realization. All these things are arising from lack of experience. The young person simply has not yet a sufficient knowledge of the kind of world in which he is going to live. He does not understand the inner guidances which become the basis of the development and, and uh, maturing of human character. So we can say, looking over the problem, that in homes at the present time, crimes are committed every day, crimes that will never be punished, and that individuals treat their own relatives far worse than they would dare to treat strangers. If you steal from a stranger, you will go to jail. If you steal from your relatives, they are expected to forgive you and perhaps give you a bonus. Uh, the relationships in families are such that mutual imposition 
is among the most common problems of the day. Also, we find that these families are composed of persons who are undisciplined as individuals. They have never thought for a moment of sacrificing themselves. They have developed the code of sacrificing other people to their own desires, and they do this generously. They expect in marriage to have all the freedoms that they had without marriage. They expect in no way to feel any restraint upon their actions. Our mental hospitals today are loaded with neurotics whose neuroses have resulted from the fact that having raised families, they cannot continue to do exactly as they please. They have to give up or sacrifice something. And there are cases of individuals who have had nervous breakdowns and have committed suicide at the horrible necessity of remaining at home with their own children. For some reason, we are not producing the kind of young people who recognize the importance of sharing the values of life. Now, there are some who feel that marriage is done for as far as Western man is concerned. But these have not taken into consideration the, bi the basic biological pressures which are within man. Nor have they taken into full account that man and all his tribe are part of a great natural plan of things which has its own purposes. And one of these purposes is that the individual shall come to that degree of inner insight in which he can share and to at least a degree modify his own selfishness. The purpose of nature is cooperation, whereas in human nature we see too much of competition. So nature is not going to permit marriage to cease entirely, but it is going to force the individual to recognize that there are rules governing marriage as there are in every other area of life. To break these rules is to suffer, regardless of our own arrogance or our own sophistication. To ignore these rules is to suffer. Peace and happiness comes only through obeying the rules governing the area of life under consideration. So, the rules governing marriage have a reason for their existence. Nature has produced two distinct types of human beings, one we call male and the other female. They are not the same kind of being in two kinds of bodies. Man is not man because of physical gender. He is man because of psychological integration. The same is true of woman. She is not woman because she is in a feminine body. She is woman because she has a feminine psychic integration. Each of these integrations is in some way polarized. There is a truth behind all these things which we cannot deny. And that is that neither man nor woman is truly complete. Some can achieve more of completeness than others. There are some who are certainly by psychic temperament not suited for domestic living. But in the great majority of instances, nature has set up this polarization for a reason. What nature wishes to do is to broaden and deepen the psychic life of the human being. Man is deeply within his own nature, androgynous. Within the depths of his own psychic integration, he is also both male and female. But one part of his nature is submerged. And in man, the anima is subjective. In woman, the animus is subjective. Each is therefore seeking complement, seeking completion, 
and also confronted with one of the great opportunities which nature provides for the enlargement of consciousness. All relationships are successful when they contribute to understanding. And the, one of the great purposes of our associations in life, one of these purposes is understanding, enrichment, the gradual development of a more perfect inner selfness than we could otherwise experience. Thus, in the course of time, male and female beings are brought together for the purpose not only of generating the species, but of regenerating themselves. And both experiences are involved in this relationship. Each is seeking to release a psychic experience which enriches and perfects and ennobles. Yet this cannot be achieved unless the submerged parts are brought forth by sympathy. We cannot be forced into any relationship with life. We cannot be compelled to like or dislike. We must experience all of these things from within ourselves, according to our own natures and needs. But there can be no doubt that marriage is a great opportunity for growth, and growth is the reason for life. If man was created to be happy, the plan has been a dismal failure. But if man was cre to created to grow, and given the right, to have happiness as a byproduct of accepted growth, then he still has a tremendous project before him, a tr tremendous potential achievement. Then, the family. What is the family? The family is a group of persons bound together by blood or marriage, which is a kind of social unit, a little commonwealth. Confucius had much to say concerning the family. He declared it to be the microcosm of the state. And he pointed out very clearly that as the, goes the family, so goes the nation. And that no nation has ever survived the breakdown of its homes. The family is the most intimate area of consciousness by which we become aware of life. The child growing up first experiences life as in the family. These first experiences leave deep etchings upon the psychic nature of the child. And the child that enjoys the security of a family has an experience to pass on to its children, which is rich and important and all-powerful in the framing of future generations. The family, then, is actually a mature responsibility to be assumed with thoughtfulness, even with prayerfulness. Certainly never for the sole purpose of gratifying uh, physical propensities. To the degree that we think of family only in terms of physical gratification of physical impulses and urges. To that degree, we are destroying the family life of our nation. This does not mean that we shall eliminate or ignore the sexual factor in marriage. But marriage built upon sex is a failure to start with, that it cannot hold. It will lead to promiscuity, it will result in tragedy. I think we must finally come back to the original oriental thought. The true foundation of marriage is mutual respect, in which each person is keenly aware of the unusual characteristics of the other, and is proud of those characteristics in that other person, and wishes to help them to develop to even greater manifestations. A marriage must be built upon a sincere desire 
for mental, emotional, psychological comradeship. Under such conditions, physical associations complement and complete the union. But without overtone, these physical things fail and always have failed. And when we realize the situation as it is in America today, we have to realize that marriage is not suitable for young people who consider it merely a form of action, merely an opportunity to vent some tremendous pent-up emotional urge. Marriage is not merely an emotional experience. Marriage is the consummation and culmination of a plan, a purpose which nature has held from time immemorial. It, it must either ad help to advance man or it must tear down and destroy the noblest part of man's nature. Today, the majority of homes are bad. They may not be broken, some of them cannot break, simply because of religious restrictions. Others do not break because of numerous factors, financial, social, and other. But the majority of homes are not being held together by mutual respect. The individuals in these homes are not there because of all places on earth that is where they most want to be. And to prove this, they are not at home any more than possible. The home is very largely a hotel for these people. And they do not even have the advantage anymore of two being able to live cheaper than one. The beginning of our whole situation is this mutual respect factor. Now, people come to me every day. I've had them with several of them within the last few weeks. Whose entire concept of marriage is wrong. One individual says, I married because I did not want to live alone. A very poor excuse. Because the individual this person married was the one that then lived alone for the rest of their lives. There was no companion. The only thing that this person wanted was something to listen to, complaints. To defend and protect to comfort and be present. And as a reward for this, the individual agreed to accept these privileges without too much resistance. There was no basic comradeship of purpose. Another individual married simply because they didn't want to cook their own meals. Older people marry because they can't afford servants, so they marry one sometimes, to everyone's disaster. Some marry for wealth, for position, some marry for envy and revenge. But wherever these motives come in, you have miserable people. And I think we can say without any question in the world that of all human relationships, Marriage is the most dangerous if any ulterior motives are present. This is one area where ulterior motives are fatal. Now, occasionally you find people who almost brag of their ulterior motives. They wish to be very modern and very brittle about the whole thing. Uh, they do not wish to have any deep, serious roots in anything so far as marriage is concerned. They do not want to be hurt, and they are going to protect themselves desperately against the possibility of being hurt. They get nowhere either. They are hurt in spite of themselves, and they must stand by and hurt others and see it happen, because you cannot play lightly with these factors. If, therefore, I, if we are going to do anything about this problem that is important at all, I think we're going to have to get right down to the educational level 
to these people. Perhaps what is necessary is that every individual applying for a marriage license must either produce a certificate that they have made a reasonable study in an accredited institution of marriage or make that study before the marriage is consummated. If every young person was either given some of these values in school or required to possess them before marriage, we could do a great deal more to curb this situation. We do not at the present time license an automobile driver without some test into the ability of this person to drive a car. At least we give them a sanity test. We do not do this in connection with marriage. We assume that these persons know what they want, and if they are successful in passing a test for venereal disease, they get the license. This is the only consideration. This will not solve our present problem. It did solve the problem to a measure when parents and families were close, when people lived in a comparatively simple environment and pressures were not as great as they are now. But today, marriage is a much more difficult and treacherous undertaking. It is not a problem of trying to prevent it. The problem is to try to prevent marriage from filling our mental institutions with the byproducts of its mistakes. I think that perhaps every person who marries should be required to at least listen, whether they want to or not, to a simple statement of the principles of marriage perhaps be supplied with some kind of a small book booklet or brochure and then be examined on it to know that at least they have received some basic insight. Whether they make use of it or not is hard to say, but they should not be permitted to go on in life not knowing that there are rules and continuing on through the years without the slightest suspicion that they are making their own lives miserable for everyone around them. One of the difficulties that we find today particularly is, of course, the reaction from the general pressured existence that we live. More and more we are becoming nervous wrecks. Some think we are suffering from air pollution, others from water pollution, and a great many are beginning to suspect that we are suffering from educational pollution, that we are not being taught the right things, that we are not being directed in the ways which are necessary to our well-being. In any event, the average person today is half sick from the pressure of life. In a home composed of individuals who are half sick and three-quarters selfish, there is not very much defense or support. The home is no longer a place of refuge against the world. The home is merely the continuation of the public feud. The home is no longer security, integrity, value, where people can, people can honestly be themselves. It is now an area of defenses, of a very carefully prepared strategy in which each member of the family is struggling desperately to gain some subtle advantage for himself. The home, then, is not helping to support the life of the people. The home that is beyond the means of the owner, where debt is hanging heavy, where people are struggling desperately to be happy by surrounding themselves with luxuries that they cannot afford and do not need, must ultimately awake to the fact that none of these luxuries are contributing anything to happiness. But the person today is so nervous and so tense that he cannot relax 
that he cannot enjoy life, that he cannot quietly contemplate value. He must be continuously in a state of agitation or intensity. When this happens in home life, everyone is in trouble. I have people coming to me every day telling stories of cruelty, unkindness, thoughtlessness in home life. Practically every common vice that we thought we had outgrown is back with us in full force because we have lost nearly all the graciousness of living. Now, if you are in a situation which involves some unhappiness in home patterns, there are a few things that perhaps everyone can bear in mind. I think the Oriental is right in his attitude that he should first examine himself to see what he may be contributing to the stress of the situation. In home patterns, each individual helps or hurts. There are very few who are actually neutral. So if things are not happy with you, what are you doing that is wrong? Are you trying to force situations that are not right? Are you too ambitious? Are you selfish? Or are you simply one of those, those countless persons who cannot control themselves? The most common excuse that we hear these days after a family feud is that the individual will simply say, well, I just can't help it. I was tired, I was irritated, so I flared up, and that's that. Well, an occasional flare-up may be forgiven. But as these things become more and more frequent, we have to realize a simple Greek axiom. Namely, that every time we expose a bad part of ourselves to anyone else, we destroy something of that other person's respect for us. You cannot prevent it. You cannot hold affection if you are hateful. You cannot expect other people to overlook all your faults and applaud all your virtues, any more than you are willing to overlook all the faults of other people and recognize only their virtues. The gradual building up of minor irritations, not controlled, exhibited unwisely, will ultimately completely destroy human relationships. For well, these relationships, as Confucius pointed out, are built upon dignity. And dignity is an individual so well controlling himself that he will not do or say anything that undermines the natural respect to which he is entitled. Confucius, therefore, coined this concept of the superior man. And in family, what is a superior person, whether man or woman? A superior person is one, as, as Confucius said, by nature so endowed that they have become incapable of an inferior action. Not that they control it, but that they are incapable of it. Now, an inferior action is any action which puts the individual in a bad light to himself or to others. An inferior action is to reveal to another person that you are not as fine a person as they think you are, or as you have given others to believe you to be. A person who is regarded as noble exhibits a sudden flare of jealousy or envy or petty larceny and this shows them not to be superior persons. Well, they will say, and many have said to me, so what? I'm not a superior person. I'm not trying to be. I want what I want. I'm going to say what I think. I'm going to do what I feel like doing. 
Years later, that person comes back. And they say to me, why am I lonely? Why has everyone deserted me? Why do fates turn against me? Why have I lost the respect of my children? The answer is almost always, the individual has lost these better things simply because he was resolved to do as he pleases. And what he pleases to do is not right. So we cannot allow ourselves to deteriorate within our own natures and then expect good things to happen. They will not happen. So Confucius gives us a pretty good key to what might be termed a person of character. A person of character is one who instinctively protects the happiness of others. The person of character will injure no one for any reason. The person of character will neither slander nor gossip or carry ill report of anyone. The person of character, if they come upon someone whose conduct they do not regard as proper, will bow out, but they will not condemn. The person of character will meet every responsibility with a full spirit, assuming the greatest honor to be that of fulfilling completely what is necessary and evading and avoiding nothing. The person of character will always be available in time of need, will always be a strong rock, and will always be willing to sacrifice personal happiness for greater causes. The person of character is attempting to follow heaven, to be like deity. For deity is eternally patient of all things. Deity never corrects anyone with a whip. As Graciano says, deity corrects all things with time. Time is the weapon of deity. Time is also the weapon of the wise man. For if he maintains his own integrities, time will justify him. If he does not, time will undo him. So in all things we must so act that time will prove us. We have to think only in long-range policy. When we are working with our children, we must always say to ourselves, time will pass. As I treat these children now, so must I face the consequences 10, 20, 30 years from now. Now that long time off seems distant and remote today, but it comes more quickly than we suspect. And wherever we find unhappiness in families, we find it richly deserved people have been selfish. They have tried to hope that they could be happy without communicating happiness to those around them. Now in family problems also today, there are many situations that arise from conditions that our ancestors knew very little about. One of course is the increasing education uh, most families today are composed of educated persons. Many marriages are between college graduates, and it's not in, uh, impossible that both will hold doctorates. These persons, through their education, have come to visualize the value of their own purposes. Uh, they are career conscious. Most of all, perhaps, they are convinced that each has a good mind, a mind good enough to have equality with all other minds. But in our problem, it is not so much the equality of minds that seems to be the trouble, 
as it is that these minds always see themselves as superior rather than equal. So we have mental competition very strongly marked in families, and also a reluctance to sacrifice career for family life. So that young marriages today are very often built upon the hope that this career can be sustained, and that these young people are no longer mentally and emotionally adjusted to the ordinary problems of domestic existence. They wish to continue to be rugged individualists, with marriage perhaps as a convenience, perhaps intended well enough, but with very little intimation of self-sacrifice. The um, intellectual marriage has its difficulties, but it may also have very great advantages. An intellect is not bad, but an intellect which leads us merely to arrogance is very bad. I think that one of the problems that we have here can be summed up in this way. All things being equal, the educated person of today is not what we might term maturely enlightened. Education has been the transmission of traditional knowledge. And these two young people, who both of whom have graduated with honors, are stuffed with intellectual notions. They have graduated perhaps equipped, according to our standards, to turn around and teach others. Perhaps they are equipped to make excellent careers for themselves, independent of the assistance of a marital partner. But actually, these young people starting out are for the most part profoundly ignorant. They are ignorant of value. They have mistaken intellectualism for life. And there is nothing in the college course that they have taken which really fits them to live together in cooperation as human beings. Actually, their humanity has been damaged rather than advanced. They have come to the condition in which they have substituted intellectualism for true achievement. Thus, they can go out and have careers, and they can be successful in them. And the young lady may end as the dean of women in one of our largest universities. But all through this process, she is not going to be happy. There are going to be moments that will be extremely difficult for her. There will also be a frustration within herself, which in the majority of instances leads to trouble. Occasionally, the person adapts to such a life with real serenity of spirit, but for the most part they do not. For actually what nature wants is a warm protection of life. What nature is looking for continuously is a better future generation. Nature wants those of this generation to bring into this world and rear to maturity better people than live today. Progress depends upon this. The future of the world does not depend upon a Phi Beta Kappa or anything of that nature. The future of the world depends upon bringing in intelligent, emotionally stable young people who grow up to their maturity with right ideals, right principles, and right convictions about values. So what each generation must bring into the world is a wiser generation than itself. And it cannot do this by simply leaving the younger generation to its own providences. It cannot ignore these young people or turn them over to babysitters or allow them to grow up the best they can in contentious atmospheres and produce this thing that nature demands the better generation to come. A generation emotionally stable. A generation less susceptible to crime. A generation less likely to compromise principles for advantage. 
What we must try always to do is to produce true nobility of character, true integrity of life. To the degree that any young family today fails in this task or compromises this task for its own advantage now, that family will suffer. Those people will suffer. The homes will break up. And when the time comes, we will know what it is to have a thankless child. But actually, the child is thankless because it has nothing to be thankful for. It has been deprived of value. Cominius, the father of education, pointed out that the beginning of education is that children shall learn love, honor, respect, and integrity from the knee of the parent, from infancy, and most of all from constant example. But they are sacrificing this tremendous value, that they are breaking faith with this great pattern of life that has demanded that each generation shall be better or the world shall fail. Now we are gravely concerned about some of the generation growing up. A generation that was bred in war and depression. A generation which is bearing witness today to the selfishness, indifference, or ignorance of its parents. Unless this situation changes, we have no security to look forward to. We have no reason to hope that our children will be safe even if we try, so long as they grow up in a world of neglected souls, and this is the great situation. The neglect of souls, the neglect of life, the constant growth of minds, and the neglect of spirits. These problems are real. Now we know in business that various firms and corporations are taking a deep and continuing interest in the family lives of their executives. They realize that the individual, without the support of family, whose family is exploiting him on the one hand while life is exploiting him on the other, that this individual will break. And as a result of that is a poor risk for any position of responsibility. It used to be considered a good policy to train men, wear them out, throw them away, and replace them. It is now becoming obvious that this is too expensive. What industry wants today is exactly what society needs, well-integrated people. Industry, business, economics today wants the happy, well-adjusted family person wants an individual who is secure in the respect and admiration of his family, who is cared for, who is loved and respected, and who has every reason to say with pride, my family is wonderful. These are the things that help to sustain individuals under the pressure of present world conditions. And a great many cases a failure in business can be traced directly to failure in the home. But so often today, the home doesn't really care anymore. It goes on its own way, doing as it pleases. Each individual are mindful of their responsibilities to the combination which we call home life. So if you are planning a home, think it through carefully. If you have a home, try to strengthen it through your own efforts and by trying to bring more and more of value into the home. Realize, however, what the Japanese discovered, that when you try to make this change, if you find that this home has nothing in it that will hold improvement, then the marriage was not well consummated, not thought out not given reason and value. Today, marriage counselors are being called in to help 
young people to make selections in these areas. Perhaps they are one of the best sources of immediate help in need. Also, families that are in trouble should certainly seek counseling, either with professional counselors or with their ministers. There should be outside help to try to straighten out these situations, and they should be approached honestly. If a home is impossible, there is actually no reason to tolerate it. If it is one of these things that can never get well, then those in it are going to get sicker and sicker. And under such conditions, those who strive desperately to hold it together are wrong and are trying to support a hopeless cause. Think these things through clearly and try to get a better foundation under your life. If you are in a home and uh, domestic situation, Try it with everything that you have and are to make it better. Get over, if you can, this constant sense of having been cheated by life. And realize that you are not cheated by life if you know it. If you know that a certain situation exists, no one is cheating you. They are merely confronting you with an unpleasant situation that you must face. If, then, there is any possible way of making this condition better, you should use all constructive and reasonable means. If you are impatient, and this is bringing the crisis more frequently, cultivate patience. If you have lived with a person for many years, Try to find the good in that person. Try to find again the person you married. That person is there somewhere. Realize also that life and health problems may modify dispositions, but that it always takes two to make an argument. And if one will not argue, there is no argument. Try not to be hypersensitive. Try to be just, but do not be too easily bruised. Also, recognize difficulties as opportunities for strength. The sword of spirit is tempered for the flame of suffering. The individual who rises above a situation by the strength of his own character has a great achievement, and a great achievement is never lost. I've known several persons who came to me with problems bearing upon this issue. They said, well, it's useless. The other person's impossible. Maybe. But at the time these people came to me, there were two impossible persons. One who was always wrong and the other one who was always hurt. In a few instances, I have been able to induce the one who regarded themselves as the sufferer to try to take a new basic relationship to the situation. Take it for granted that the other person isn't going to change. This you cannot force. But also take it for granted that you can change yourself if you want to. So we tried to help these people to develop a more positive, constructive, helpful, optimistic attitude toward the situation. And in many cases, I learned afterwards that to everyone's amazement, both persons changed. The individual who kept alive a controversy found ways to no longer support it, to no longer add fuel to it. And the other person also altered their attitudes. They came off of a defensive under which they had been forced. So one person, by changing themselves, may change many. But any person setting out basically to change someone else first will change nothing except for the worse. If you can break up 
your own relationship to a difficult dispositional situation. You may create an entirely new cell with a different compound. And I think we can say safely that in a family of six persons, if one makes a major change in temperament, the other five will also be modified to some degree. Consequently, nature has provided us with the only possible key to this dilemma, change self. If you have so changed yourself out of a situation of this kind, that you no longer deserve it, the chances are very strong that the situation itself will basically alter. We are in a certain locked pattern of difficulties because we deserve to be there. And the moment we no longer deserve a situation, we are not the victim of it. Everything has to be deserved. Both happiness and misery must be earned. And the person is miserable because they have not yet learned enough to outgrow their own misery. And we have all taken it for granted that we are miserable because of others. While this continues, there is no answer to anything. We try desperately to change other people, and we all die of a broken heart together. It will not work. I have noted on some scores of occasions in the last 45 years that people locked into situations were released by changing themselves. The situations broke up. Patterns change, basically, the moment the existing pattern was no longer necessary for educational purposes. So we strongly advise the individual to seek solutions by solving a problem in himself, realizing that the shortcut to peace is to cease discord in yourself. That no matter what the problem is, if you will solve your own relationship to that problem, you will be liberated from it. The reason that you are not liberated is because you have not solved. Also, if you solve the problem correctly, you are not only freed of the present emergency, but most of all, you are liberated from those negative memories, those long-range heartaches, those unforgivable affronts that we nurse from the moment they occur to the grave. We can actually free ourselves from one of the most dangerous of all enemies, and that is our own unhappy, dishonest memories. The long-range self-pity that comes from this conviction that the whole world is wrong and we are the victim. Let's, for our own good, just change the whole pattern. If we believe long enough that we are the innocent victims of others. We will end with a mental or emotional breakdown because we live in a dishonest universe. And if the universe is dishonest, what can any of us do? The only way out of this problem is to recognize our own responsibility and recognize that the only thing that nature expects of us is that we shall outgrow any littleness that is burdening us with pain. We do this. We keep our pact with life itself. I think in the case of the same domestic situation, Buddhistic philosophy is most helpful. Buddhism simply teaches that all relationships in life are psychological. But actually, no people are bound by any ties to other people. They are bound only by attitudes, by voluntary commitments. And an individual who is bound by love is no longer bound if that love dies. We are bound by our attachments, 
and we are in a certain sense also negatively bound by our antagonisms because when we are antagonistic we can never be free of the object of our antagonism. So in Buddhism all these attitudes are simply conditions that arise in ourselves. We say to ourselves we are hurt. Immediately we are hurt. We say that there is no justice in the universe. Immediately the universe bursts forth with a vast blaze of injustice. We say that other people are cruel. Immediately cruelty moves in upon us from all directions. All of these are estimates. And while we are suffering from our estimate, our next door neighbor is enjoying himself greatly in the same situation because his estimate is different. To the friendly person, the universe is friendly. To the unfriendly, the universe is antagonistic. But it's all one world. And it's one world of things simply as they are. It is our own attitudes that gild these various realities and make them dramatic or cover them with a dark cloud of despondency. So it all rests with us. It may be that in some past time we have had unfinished business with other people. We injured them. Buddha said, if so, we must pay this injury. So if other individ individuals are cruel, the only answer, as he says, is patience. To meet the payment with insight. With the realization that out of the full meeting of debt, we ch achieve liberation. But we must also be continuously watchful lest we create further negative situations for ourselves. The only way to ensure our own happiness in this life or in any life that lies beyond is to live with complete sincerity now. To do always that which is the kindest and noblest that we know. To hold no grudges. But to perpetuate no grievances neither to condemn nor to blame, but always in all things striving continuously for an inward peace and an experience of the goodness of life itself. That all these experiences and all these things are lessons which we can learn. If we can learn them happily, we have happiness here. If we can only learn them through misery, we are miserable here. But in the great pattern of things, all these situations that arise are simply of our desiring. We have allowed the flames of anger or hate to rise and burn and injure us. Every negative attitude destroys. Every unkind thought sickens. And wherever we have these relationships with other people, if these relationships are good, everyone is enriched. If they are negative, if they are selfish, if they are ulterior, everyone is impoverished. The individual who marries another person simply for security has no right to expect that. An individual who will unite in matrimony and at the same time, as some have told me, they have said simply, I married this person, but I didn't care for them. How can such an individual expect anything from it? How can they expect a false attitude of their own, supported by deceit, to produce anything but misery? All these things have to be understood and thought through. We have to be scrupulously honest in our emotional relationships. We have to be true to the best of our ability or we create terrible penalties. I think, therefore, that our main concern at the moment, perhaps, is to review life, assuming that we are in one of three relationships to life at the present time. Either we are young, starting out, if so, we should use every means in our power to understand the responsibilities of mature life. We should never permit our lives to be 
defeated merely by some passing impulse of the moment. We should think things through. Marry persons whom we admire. Unite ourselves with those whose virtues we know to be solid and reliable. To think through the long day in which these relationships must endure. And if we have started out with some distinct and sincere effort to make a good thing of a marriage, to be prepared to be unselfish, to be prepared to sacrifice something of ourselves. It is sacrifice that makes us great and gratification that keeps us small. We have the right, therefore, to that wonderful growth of the individual who forgets himself in dedicated service to that which he admires or respects. And if he truly admires and truly respects, this dedication is not difficult. But if this true admiration is not present, the dedication is almost tragic. Those who have gone on into the middle stream of life, who have established their families, may perhaps be experiencing a rather unpleasant boredom. They have reached the realization that they are married to uninteresting people. People who have not bright and sparkling ideas people who are heavy and logy and well settled in their ruts, people who are not glamorous and lack the quality of the gallant movie star, people who we have to look at every day and wonder why in the world we ever married them in the first place. And then we begin to soften a little. We get a bit of guilt over our own feelings. We remember that these people have been faithful. They have tried. They had one tremendous drawback which we didn't recognize soon enough. They were dull. And being dull, they were good providers. And being good, honorable providers, they were almost certainly dull. But this is life. Now, under such conditions as this, Boredom can lead gradually to tragedy. The individual becomes desperate in this presence of a situation that seems to be tightening around them. At 20, it wasn't so serious. They might do something about it at 30. But at 50, it gets to be serious because nobody knows what they're going to do about it at 60. Probably nothing. They're just going to endure each other to the grave. This is enough to cause a very noble frustration. What can you do about such cases as this? Well, one thing that everyone can do and can desperately try to communicate is interest. To find, if humanly possible, an interest in common. Now, I've had people come to me and say, yes, that's a splendid idea, but the only things that this other person is interested in, I am not interested. That can be. But you could also reverse the statement and simply say that the only things you're interested in, the other person isn't interested in. These things read both ways. Someone in this pattern has got to make the big step. Step out from their own interest and try to find the interests of another person. This can be done and has paid off on a number of very remarkable occasions. We are not very sure sometimes about how interesting other people's interests can be if we have spent all our lives regretting that they had them and defeated because they didn't have our interests. Someone may have to step across this interval. And if it cannot be the other person for lack of insight, then it may have to be you but try to find this interest. Find something that can be done together. Because as you get older, you fall into the Japanese pattern. It becomes more and more vital that you have togetherness. 
You have to have this support. Or else life gets to be very difficult. Sometimes also these uninterested, un uninteresting people can unite their resources upon some other person or some project. They may find a common ground in their children or their grandchildren. They may find some philanthropy that intrigues them both. Or they may be able to take a friendly, if not profound, interest in each other's activities, finding in these common activities the basis of a very valuable conversation. Because if each, in his own way, can have experiences and communicate them, these experiences can be the basis of common interest. But where this dullness exists, there must be some effort made to try to fill it. And if all else fails, and nothing seemingly can fill it, then the person who recognizes the need must take on new activities, must find ways of self-expression that give them a larger fulfillment in life. It is a matter of planning a project to prevent this dullness from settling in, because if it does, life is going to be very unhappy. Now, with the very aged, those whose lives are in the very late evening, uh, there may not be quite so many pressures or so much to be accomplished. Uh, usually, there is a certain a deep discouragement by this time, if there is problem. Or the individual is resigned to inevitables. And very often, the tensions and pressures and antagonisms slowly relax. If they do not, that is a sign there is much too much psychotic pressure. What will the older people, the inner life, becomes the great solution to all things? Contemplation, kindliness. The aged, like the very young, build halos around those they love. The aged see virtues where they are not, even as middle life sees vices where they may not be. But in the older years, the individual naturally seeks to put his own life in order. He wants to, be, to have a good spirit for the transition that lies ahead. So in those older years, the person is susceptible to mysticism, uh, to prayerfulness, to religious insight, uh, to those patiences that arise from faith. And as glamours and these matters have become less, it is quite possible for these people to find a, a rather quiet, congenial, friendly relationship. In our Western world, married couples who have made it for 40 or 50 years are most successful if in the end they have become friends. This seems to be the one reward. And friendliness... Uh, comes again to be less selfish. A friend, in a sense, is one we serve because we regard them well. And this, in very many instances, is the best description uh, that we have of older compatibilities. They are friendly. There is no need of these terrible tempests of emotion and attitude. Rather, quietude that becomes the major solution. I think that in the modern business today, in modern problems, there are things we should bear in mind. I think that every person who is unable through his educational facilities uh, to find some basic insight into marital problems and domestic situations should at least read carefully a few well-selected texts on the subject, and should, if possible, discuss their emotional plans with a clergyman or a counselor. As the situations arise in life, the individual simply cannot see them clearly enough by the background of our ways. Fifty, seventy-five years ago, many marriages began in church associations. The parents went to the same church. The young people more or less grew up together. 
This was some supporting help. They had a faith in common. Uh, because they came from the same church background, they also had certain social compatibilities. But these no longer are protectives. Uh, individuals now marry with little regard to previous association, and sometimes in great haste. Occasionally these hurried marriages are inspired and wonderful, but they can also present problems as time goes on. If problems arise, what are the young people equipped to do these days? Very little, if anything. The problems that arise have to be solved the best they know how. If they are very honest young people, they may solve them among themselves. If they are less solutional, they may turn to family. If the family is called upon, it must be wise, unselfish, kind, and just. Otherwise, it will complicate the situation more. All through this hectic period of from 30 to 50 years, in which human beings must labor with these problems of relationships, uh, the pressures are difficult, and today uh, the nervous tension is very serious. It is much worse than it has ever been before. The only answer we have for any of these things is an answer that you cannot force upon anyone, but which is the only answer. The only answer to all error is truth, regardless of how you look at it. And truth in matrimony and in family relationships is a very simple thing. Truth is a very flat statement that true love forgets self in the service of that which it loves. And two people who forget themselves take good care of each other. But each individual trying desperately to take care of himself, nothing is cared for properly. So all our basic relationship in life depends upon the individual putting the good of others before his own. In matrimony, this is absolutely necessary. In raising of children, there is great sacrifice, for it is not always easy today to meet the challenge of young people, their education, their personalities, and their problems. But it can only happen where there is a deep affection. If this affection is absent, the parents will go into nervous decline, they will collapse, they will be mental and emotionally sick, and will probably end by breaking up their homes largely under the pressure of their children's requirements. Whether it be in relation to children or parents or husband and wife, the final answer to this whole thing, as Buddha pointed out in the Mita Sutra, is unselfish love. Love suffereth long and is kind. Where we love we give our time and our conspiracy to bringing happiness to the beloved. Where, when we love, we do not wish to bring a moment of pain or strain or sorrow or burden to the person we care for. If we observe that we are spending so much that the other person is worried, we would no longer spend because to keep this person happy is our happiness. If to get what we want is our happiness, we have broken the rule and therefore have forfeited our right to good family relationships. In all these matters, true love solves problems. True love does not overlook the weaknesses in others, but this affection remains regardless. And our natural affection is to serve and help that which we love. Today we desperately need the experience of honest love, and very few people have it. We can never build a good generation while our final affection is reserved for ourselves. Too many people today are in love with themselves. 
And a person in love with himself can never be in love with anything else. In the effort, therefore, to cater forever to self, we sacrifice others and their happiness and their rights to our own desires. Where we know this temperament and this characteristic is strong in us, we have no right to create families. Because the individual who does not have the natural instinct to give of himself for that which he loves has no basis for marriage or parenthood. And as our generation is taught selfishness and is taught the importance of keeping mind largely upon self in the name of success. We are training people to be bad husbands and wives. We are training them to overlook their basic natural instincts and take on an assumed and false combativeness which can bring them neither satisfaction nor peace of soul. So I think the answer to all of our big questions is true love. Love that is not founded in physical things alone, but love that is founded in the desire of the individual to protect, to serve, to help that which it loves. Love must always have in it the desire to save the other person from pain, from sorrow, from hurt. A love does not demand, it gives. Love requires nothing of itself. Love does not even demand that it be returned. But as St. Francis so wisely pointed out, that the great mystery of love is to love, not to be loved. The individual who, in the full expression of a deep devotion, dedicates itself to the happiness of another, in this protects and fulfills its own happiness. For then whatever we do that brings joy to another brings joy to ourselves. In this way our happiness is magnified and increased because we have learned the art of creating happiness. We have learned that the only happiness that we can really have is when we have been of constructive, valuable service to the needs of others. If we, if we have this attitude, we can be fathers and mothers, and we will succeed. Because in that condition, we have a happiness and a dedication that is most truly spiritual. We have something that transcends, something that lifts us up. And in this true dedication, we really cannot be hurt because we would not even know hurting. We are not hurt if we are not selfish. We are not hurt if we demand nothing for ourselves. And in a strange, mysterious way, our very unselfishness brings us the greatest securities that we can possibly know. So in these times when sincerity is not too common, we can strongly advocate it. We can also point out the tremendous need for honest affection. An affection that causes the parent to really love the child not by word and not by gift, but by association. A parent that would gladly give the child many physical comforts, provide for it, educate it, will not give that child the parent's own companionship. The parent is too busy, doing too many other important things. It is enough to provide for the child. It is not enough. It is never enough unless the child receives love. And love is again the giving up of self to the need of that child. And it is this giving up which later the child will reward by an enduring affection. And if this giving up of self is not present, the child will stray away and the parent will feel alone and deserted. 
So these, devo these devout devotions, these simple integrities, these great principles of truth, must underlie domestic relations. Where they do, these relations do succeed. Where they are absent, we have the panorama of today of great emotional instability, sickness, misery, all, as Buddha points out, traceable to one thing, self-interest, that which is forever seeking the superiority of itself, that which is forever seeking the advancement of itself, fails in all things. For it is like the man of whom it is said, if he saves his life, he shall lose it. But if he loses his life for the sake of truth, he shall have life everlasting. And to give of self for the sake of love, for the sake of those whom we have loved and whom we do love and who need us and who depend upon us, this affection prepares us to receive love everlasting. But we have to earn it. And all of our relationships have to be upon these integrities, or they will certainly fail. The only answer to our domestic problem of today is that we love someone sufficiently to forget ourselves. For everyone who is sick mentally and emotionally is thinking too much about himself. And help is the forgetting of self in the remembering of something greater than self. And to everyone who truly loves, that which he loves is greater than himself. Whether it be his marriage partner, his child, or his God in heaven. For it is the giving of self in love that is the perfection of the alchemy of human relationships. And when we do this, nature rewards us mightily. And we should teach this. We should convey it to our children. We should make it part of the basic code of modern life. Well, I guess our time is up, so we thank you very much.